and welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today in the show, we have Robin Dickinson. She is a family physician and she wrote the Kevin MD article, My Child Wants to Be a Doctor. Robin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here. We'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and journey to where you are today? Certainly. So I grew up in what I call a normal community. I mean, most of my friends' parents were house painters, child care workers, just kind of normal people. And to me, that's what's normal. Um, what wasn't normal was becoming a physician. I was really lucky because my mom is college educated and she always pushed me. I mean, I expected to go to college someday, which was not what my friends were expecting necessarily. So I aspired kind of in a different direction and it, it changed how I lived my life, how I studied. But at the same time, there wasn't the economic support behind that expectation, which was very challenging. So in high school, I was just planning on going to community college and then somehow from there becoming a physician. And it was my high school chemistry teacher who kept saying, you should go to this university, you should go to that university, you can go anywhere you want. And I, I graduated valedictorian from my high school, but I couldn't go anywhere I wanted. I mean, I couldn't afford to fly out for interviews. I couldn't afford application fees. I couldn't afford, you know, all the stuff that you do in order to go to those places. And, you know, really, my family needed me too. I'm the oldest of six kids. And I wanted to be at home with them helping. My mom was, was stressed taking care of everybody. So I didn't want to just take off. So it was all these competing, I want to be a doctor, I want to be there for my family, I don't have the money, I don't have the opportunities, how do I make this happen? And it was actually my high school chemistry teacher who took me to visit the university I ended up attending. She introduced me to the head of the biology department, she took me to the financial aid office, she was the connector that I needed. And I think that's one of the things we don't recognize about students from lower socioeconomic status is it's not just about the money, it's about the connections, it's about the opportunities. And now that I'm a physician, I look at my children and I see they're nine and 12 and they're already on track to have a certain kind of life. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're, we're missing the boat with students from lower socioeconomic status if we're not giving them opportunities from a fairly young age and supporting them in a lot of different ways, whether it's making it more financially accessible to be able to be in that pipeline towards medicine, or also giving them the connections and the opportunities that may not be coming to them naturally. Tell me a story or if you share an anecdote, what are some of those unique challenges that are applicable to people who don't have the economic means to go into medical school? And as you know, medical school certainly is a daunting financial challenge for those with economic means. So I can't even imagine people with less economic means. So paint a picture of some of the unique challenges that they face during their medical education journey. Oh, for sure. So, you know, I, I actually have a small group of people that I, we have kind of a club we call Physicians with Personal Experience in Poverty, which it's a small group. About 5% of medical students are come from the lowest 20% of income. So it's a not a lot, but that's one in 20. You probably know at least 20 medical students and probably one of them comes from poverty. And it sets up this whole different set of problems. When you're in college, you have to choose between a job to pay for college or research that is going to help with your application. And for me, I chose a job. And so during all my breaks, I was working as many hours as I possibly could because I tried to limit my hours during classes to keep my grades up. So it's, you know, trying to make those decisions. My medical school, thankfully, was very understanding of that. They were really seeming to look for that diversity. Um, telling my personal story was part of my application. And, you know, they didn't, they didn't penalize me for not knowing doctors. You know, I, I tried so hard to find doctors to shadow, but I didn't have any connections. And they didn't penalize me for that. You know, I volunteered at a hospital, but I was carrying binders around. And they, they let that be good enough. You know, that I was... I was working, I was doing volunteer work, but I didn't have time to do a big research project because I needed the money to pay for my tuition and fees and gas and food and all that stuff. And, and they appreciated that. But I've heard stories from so many other students who are having to choose 
and maybe you're going hungry instead of working in order to do something that they've been told is important for their application. And that's just not okay. That shouldn't be happening. And once people are in medical school, you don't, you don't have that kind of like foundation and support that you might otherwise have. And so people will be maybe not eating as much as they could. They might not have reliable transportation. You know, so many of my friends in medical school, they got their cars from their parents when they were in college or when they graduated. I paid for my car. You know, I paid for, and we held it together with duct tape and bailing wire, literally duct tape and bailing wire until the moment I signed for my first job after residency and I could get a car loan and upgrade to something that was not held together with duct tape and bailing wire. So it's something that you don't think about all these little details that just make it so much harder that you're not, you don't have the brain space to do everything, but you're having to. Can you share how your lived experience that you just described, how has that influenced you as a physician today? You know, having experienced living in a lower socioeconomic status, having experienced not having opportunities, it's, you know, for me, I was definitely buffered some from it because of my family who really tried to make sure that I saw beyond that. But so many of my friends were so stuck in survival that it's really hard to see beyond that. And I think it really changes how I work with my patients, because if you've never experienced that, it's really easy to say, well, why don't you just, just do this? You know, why don't they just do that? Well, it'd be really easy to just do this. And what you don't understand is that poverty comes with all the problems together. It's not like you don't have money, but you do have stable housing, food accessibility, a good social network, good connections, a job that you love. Like, if you don't have money, you probably have a pretty lousy job. I mean, it may be that you really like the people you're with, but it's gonna be physically demanding, underpaid, underappreciated much of the time. You know, if you have food insecurity, you have housing insecurity. Even if you have a place to live, maybe you can't repair the toilet and you're currently pooping in a bucket. Maybe you can't afford to repair the stove and so you're cooking on a little burner on your counter. So there's all these complexities of just trying to survive that I think if someone's never lived that experience or had very, very close connections in that community, it's so easy to just minimize it and think that people should just get over it and do what they're supposed to do. And it's just not that simple. Just daily life is so challenging. All right, let's transition now to the Kevin MD article that you wrote. It's titled, My Child Wants to Be a Doctor. Now, for those who didn't get a chance to read that article, can you just walk my audience through it and share the story of why you decided to write it? Between my different things that I do, I have a curriculum for kids, a pre-medical curriculum, um, and I also teach at a medical school. I, I've taken any kid who wants to shadow me, I will take them because I was that kid who didn't have a doctor to shadow. And so, you know, I don't care what their background is. I don't care if they don't know the right thing to wear, which I sure didn't know. Um, I was the only person who showed up to my medical school interview not in a suit. I felt very out of place, but um, it worked out. And, you know, I, with all that stuff, I keep getting all these questions about anything from my own experiences to what they should be doing. And when you Google it or do any sort of internet search, what you get is a lot of different websites that are trying to make money off of you. And so they're increasing your anxiety. They're saying you have to pay us this huge amount of money to get any advice at all. You have to jump through our hoops. You have to take our classes. And it, it makes that barrier to entry even higher than it would be otherwise. And so I wanted to write something that said, here are things that you can do without having a lot of money. And I didn't want to package it as, you know, oh, this is for the poor people because that's obnoxious. <laughs> you know, I instead wanted to say like, this is for everybody, you know, anybody who's in the situation. And, you know, of course, people who are, from a higher socioeconomic status, they're going to be able to find people in their network to give that advice. But people like me, I wouldn't have had that. So I wanted that available to everyone to kind of level that playing field a bit. Now, what are the biggest pieces of actionable advice that you could share with parents whose children are potentially interested in medicine? I mean, I think the biggest things are to support them no matter what. You know, if whether it's something that it seems impossible which, you know, for me, going to medical school really did seem impossible. And I did it anyways. And it was people believing in me, my mom, my teachers, you know, people who 
didn't really look at all the, the barriers, they looked at the potential and and that really made a difference. Um, and but also if they don't go to medical school, that's great too. Like don't penalize them for it. Be just unconditionally love them for what they're doing. And then give them lots of opportunities, even if you can't, you know, don't have the connections to an actual physician, maybe beyond the one who sees someone for a well child check once a year. Mm-hmm. You know, go to the library, watch documentaries, get biographies, you know, try to get whatever information you can to start tasting that world. And then also learning human biology and, you know, doing what you can from home that's affordable, that's accessible. So when you say doing things from home, are you talking about like online courses in terms of learning human anatomy and biology? I mean, nowadays the internet has so much free information. YouTube is a great resource. Um, I think I mentioned Violin MD, which is one of my my personal favorite YouTube channels for aspiring physicians, because she's a resident um, through much of it. It's obviously a channel, so it goes over through time, and it really shows the inside of a hospital and talks about medical problems. Um, you know, I I have my own curriculum that I created again for children because so many kids don't have access to a good human biology curriculum. I was lucky to several times growing up um, be able to do a class at the Nature and Science Museum, and it was completely blew my mind um, what what the human body does, and that just is not accessible in a lot of kids books, um, especially ones that are affordable for families in lower socioeconomic status. You know, there's some great DK books that are thirty two dollars, but that could be three days of food for the family. Now, of course, you talk to a lot of parents whose children are potentially interested in medicine. Share some of the most common questions that you receive from them. So the, I think the biggest thing parents think about is how do you how do you prepare? What classes do you take? How do you how do you become a smart enough, good enough person? And I think that oftentimes we've missed the boat on that. We want well-rounded people. We want caring people. Certainly, you have to do well on tests. You have to take certain classes. But that's what everybody does. And I think quite often being able to be well-rounded not only makes you stand out in your applications, but makes you a better provider once you're actually out there being a physician, doing what you do. We're talking to Robin Dickinson. She is a family physician and she wrote the Kevin MD article, My Child Wants to Be a Doctor. Robin, if you were to take this journey all over again, start from the beginning, and knowing what you know now, is there anything that you would have done differently? Boy, that's a tough one. You know, I think I did the best I could with what I knew at the time. I think, you know, what I wish is that there had been more support and opportunities from the medical community, Mm -hmm. starting long before I was in medical school, starting when I was in elementary school. You know, I knew I wanted to be a doctor when I was six. Many of the students who use my curriculum are six, seven, eight, nine years old. And, you know, within certain circles, that's an age where you really encourage your children and you are pay for camps, you connect them with doctors in your network. And for children in other communities, that's not an option. And I wish that for me, you know, I wish my doctor had said, yeah, come shadow me instead of saying, oh, you know, we don't, we don't take students in this, in this clinic. Like that, she was literally the only doctor I knew. And trying to make connections beyond that was impossible. Like, where do you get an in? And I wish there was more effort from the medical community to reach out to those students of lower socioeconomic status from elementary school, middle school, high school, college. And among medical students, be aware as you're interviewing, as you're choosing who's going to be part of your class that, yeah, maybe they aren't going to have the research. Maybe they aren't going to have been published five times. Maybe they aren't going to have done all the amazing things because for them, getting through college and doing the things they did was amazing. You know, they were starting from a different mm-hmm. point and they're showing that they can, you know, they can make it through a lot and really can, can do a lot more for themselves maybe than some of the students who've done very impressive things on paper but had a lot of support and a lot of funding behind it and a lot of family connections and so forth. And as you're choosing, you know, do what my medical school did. Don't look at the fact I was not wearing a suit Mm -hmm. and that I hadn't done all the little fancy things that you're supposed to do. And instead, look at the fact that I could be a really good doctor and, you know, choose that way. And then once they're there, support them because, you know, it's going to be harder. I'm really grateful my medical school did provide me 
a variety of different kinds of support in just figuring out the culture and figuring out how to survive and what to wear and all sorts of things and provide that support for students who are coming from backgrounds where that's not going to come naturally. And my final question, what's your take home message that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? Support students from all socioeconomic backgrounds and let's talk about diversity, including socioeconomic status, because that's where we're really going to, you know, start seeing more diversity in other areas as well, whether it's ethnic, race, religious, we're going to, that's a basis for so many other kinds of diversity. And how can people reach you? So my curriculum website is Dr. Robin's School. The address is docrobinschool.com, which is D-O-C, Robin like the bird, school.com. And people can always contact me through that website. Robin, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. Thank you so much.